Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries podcast with me, your host, John, and today we're going to be taking a look at the module Terror in the Streets for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Terror in the Streets is a hardback full colour module for the OSR clone Lamentations of the Flame Princess. It's set in Paris, 1630, or a fictional version of it. Children have started going missing, parents are fearful and paranoid, the people of Paris are becoming angry and restless. A mysterious phantom figure haunts the streets, kidnapping the innocent for who knows what ungodly ends. It's written and drawn by Kelvin Green, who has done a number of Lamentations modules that I've very much enjoyed in the past, and it's described as a historically inspired, investigative, urban horror adventure for characters of most levels. Starting off on the inside cover, we have a sort of slightly abstract map of Paris in 1630 with some numbered and lettered locations. And it doesn't attempt to capture every single street. That'd be a ridiculous endeavor, but it gives you a sort of flavor of the map. It's color. I really like that. It looks great. And on the back inside cover, we have a picture that almost puts me in the mind of a Where's Wally picture, or Where's Waldo if you're in the US. And it's this city scene with lots of little individual quirky cartoon characters drawn in it with sort of period clothing. There's people like in stocks. There's a guy with a massive hat strutting about. There's people buying stuff at a market. There's an old man with a stick, a tiny little dog. Loads of lovely little details like a foot pad lurking behind a building. Someone about to empty a chamber pot. Really great. And every time I look at it, I see little details that I haven't spotted before. So I think that's a really great little picture. We get a an introduction from the author where he talks about how the adventure module came to be. In particular, James Raggy, who's behind the Lamentations saying that he wanted an adventure with a certain acronym because it would amuse him. This is in the slightly irreverent style that you'll come to know in the rest of the book. Even the author refers to this as a sliver of pretentious game fiction, like what we had in the 90s. And it very much, as someone who was role-playing a lot of World of Darkness and stuff like that in the 90s, very much did feel like that for me. Now, this sort of tone's maintained to varying degrees throughout the book. There's some parts where it really seemed to work for me. It's nice, it's light and breezy, it's very easy to read. And other places where it didn't really seem to land, and I thought it was unnecessary trying to just sort of get a cheap laugh I suppose nothing wrong with that it just didn't really work for me in some parts but lest you think that, that means I think this book is bad far from it I actually really like this book so we go on to get a bit of a breakdown of how to run the adventure as the author says, it's the hunt for a serial killer in Paris during the year 1630. But there's no direct path, no railroad, no highway that the heroes have to take through this. We're given events, locations and clues. And it's down to the player characters to connect those up and reach some sort of conclusion. It even says here they might get distracted by a minor detail and the killer might escape. So... The idea is we're presented with a sequence of events and a bunch of clues to throw the players and they solve it. Great, absolutely cracking. We then move on to a little discussion which I found really interesting about how modern day investigations of crime scenes differ from how they would have done in the past. You know, various things like the importance of evidence nowadays, which could have been used back then, but just wasn't something people thought of. And you could be tried based on your reputation, who your father was, stuff like that. We get a note on using bloodhounds or animals to track people and some Lamentation stats for bloodhounds, which could easily be used in any sort of OSR game. And I think that's a great idea. Just a nice little thing to drop in there. We're given details of the main antagonist, but before I go any further, consider this your spoiler warning. We're definitely going to be getting spoilers from here on out, so I'll give you a couple of moments to decide whether you want to carry on listening to this, or whether you're going to set it down for a while and come back once you've played the adventure. Everyone good? 
Right, let's crack on. So the main antagonist is Claude Marchand, the illegitimate older half-brother of Cardinal Richelieu, because, of course, he's got to turn up, hasn't he, because it's set in France during this time period. He's effectively operating under the delusion, or perhaps not, as one of the box apps suggests that maybe this is true. It's down to the GM. That a great disaster is going to befall France, and that in order to stop it, he has to kill a number of demons that are masquerading in the guise of innocent children. And he makes a sort of strange, like, skin suit out of them. Pretty gruesome stuff. And like I said, there's a little box out where it basically says, the default assumption is that he's just mad or he's deluded. But if you want to in your games, maybe it's actually the truth. At the start of the adventure, he's killed four of the eight people he needs to. And he's going to select and kill the remainder over the next few days. Once all eight are killed, he'll wait a couple of days. And when the disaster doesn't occur, he'll assume that he's been correct. The disaster has been averted and he'll disappear into the background of history. We get a lovely little cartoon style picture of Claude Marchand and some stats for him. A little box out as well on the skin suits, which are basically just leather armor on the default assumption. But you know, if you want to tweak it, you can always do something with that. We then get stats for Cardinal Armand Jean du Plessis, aka Cardinal Richelieu, who is the arch manipulator that we all know from the Three Musketeers and stuff like that. He's a huge political power in France at the time. We're given some stats for him here, which aren't particularly powerful, you know, in terms of like raw stats. But the author does say, you know, if you've got to have him as a class character, he's going to be at least a 10th level cleric who's always casting augury and divination so he knows what's going on. We get a nice picture from Henry Mott, 1881, showing Cardinal Richelieu, and then again some more stats. And I love the fact he's given a non standard ability here, which is this four dimensional chess ability where basically he has a 90 percent chance of if someone tries to get the better of him of having already considered that plan and put sort of counter plans in motion to stop it which i think is a really cool idea to represent something like this without it seeming too contrived we get some background on the history of france at this time and the major players in the area and then we move on to a brief guide to paris in the 1630s we're told that the king louis the 13th is ruling from the louvre or his hunting lodge at versailles the king's advisor cardinal richelieu is charismatic clever and wields considerable influence and then you get a number of other bullet points breaking things down you know, like a city watch consisting of 300 men on horse 200 horsemen stuff like that how crimes tend to be punished in the regular day-to-day -day life so minor crimes like theft forgery and harlotry you might get publicly flogged for a few days in the stocks or something like that major crimes like arsenal assault murder etc carry the penalty of public maiming and potentially execution or life imprisonment unpleasant stuff we're told how you can get around and given some details of the taxi firms of paris and then almost in the center of the book we're going to get a double page spread showing the same map that's on the inside cover albeit this doesn't have the sort of faded parchment sort of beige color in the background so it's a little bit clearer to read we get a map key showing the location and giving details on all of the lettered and numbered locations on the map and then we move on to what I think is a really interesting mechanic, the unrest dice, which the author holds with his hands and says they've borrowed this idea from 13th Age. I've seen it on a couple of blogs as well. The idea being basically you take a big D6, put it down in the middle of the table where everyone could see it, but like a three facing upwards. And this is the level of sort of unrest as like people get more riled up with the lack of progress the law enforcement authorities are making to solve this crime. Obviously, more unrest equals the nearer people are to rioting. We're given a list of modifiers to the unrest die. So it's like plus one per child snatched after the adventure begins. Plus one if the connection between Richelieu and Claude Marchand is made public. Uh, minus one if Jean Grenier's, the, the werewolf of Paris, crimes and capture are made public. So the unrest dice can go up or down depending on the player character's progress. 
If the unrest dice gets to four, the Royal Palace of the Louvre is locked down. The home of the wizard, Alain de la Mer, is burnt to the ground by a mob. Chains and checkpoints are used during daylight hours with popular entertainment places closed down. At five, carriages stop operating, city offices are shut down, the bridges are closed to all but essential characters. At six, French soldiers are brought into the city to quell strife. No one can pass checkpoints without permission. And if Cardinal Richler is not distracted by other events going on, he takes direct control of the investigation. Following on from this, we get a double page spread containing city encounters. And for this, you roll a 1d20 plus the unrest dice and the highest level of encounter you can get is a riot as everything just goes up in this powder keg that is the city so the again the unrest dice coming in here i really like that as a mechanic both to track time and progress but also having a direct effect on stuff that's going on during the adventure we get some details of the transit companies, the taxi companies that are operating during this time. Six of them listed in here, although I gather these aren't so much based on historical uh, companies. It's difficult to find out about them. But we get six nice logos and insignias for them again. We get a timeline explaining when things are scheduled to occur, should there be no player character interference. And then a double page spread giving some suggestions as to how the characters might get involved. So this ranges from things like being hired to a letter arriving from the authorities requesting their help to them being maybe related to one of the missing children, stuff like that. And we get some stats for the deputy provost who is trying to get this matter resolved as quickly as possible. In the style of Jack the Ripper, the killer has been sending letters with pertinent details to the provost. And we get almost taunting him or daring him to be caught. We get a handout for the first letter and a nice little bit where it says what sort of key clues the players can work out for that. We then get a series of little vignettes or scenes that can be played out in different orders such as a runaway taxi the various victims what clue like in the past what clues can be found who they were who their relations are etc we then get a double page spread on a wizard known as Alain de la mer who is sort of blamed for some of these crimes because he's a weird sort of outlier character although he doesn't really actually have anything to do with it although he is a wizard and potentially involved in some arcane hijinks we then get a double page spread showing some lovely sort of combat scale maps of the wizard's tower in townhouse because he doesn't actually live in a tower he's not that stereotypical he lives in a nice townhouse then because he has a he has a sort of borderline obsession with finding out about vampires and stuff like that and he's created bizarrely enough a spell that allows him to summon a vampire but it's always the same one who's getting a bit annoyed albeit slightly resigned to like being in the middle of his day or night and then suddenly being whooped away by this teleportation spell so we get stats on Kristoff the disgruntled vampire don't know whether that's a cheeky nod again to like some 90s like World of Darkness cheddar there. But we get some lovely vampire traits which will be useful in any game using vampires in the OSR to sort of liven them up a bit and make them a little bit different. We then get some details on Marguerite Poiret who was attacked during the night of the full moon by a strange animalistic humanoid which she managed to escape albeit with some injuries. She calls this creature a werewolf and sincerely believes she's been attacked by something supernatural. However, we find out in this book that this is Jean Grenier, the werewolf of Paris, a 14-year-old lad who perhaps believes he's becoming a werewolf by putting on this sort of uh, animal skin pelt and these strange dagger-wielding gloves that he wears and goes out and attacks people or perhaps he doesn't 
but either way this is something of a red herring because he's not directly involved in this investigation and the missing children etc we then get some more vignettes along with potential future victims and future letters that might occur after the investigation has begun next we get a double page spread on the court of miracles as the author calls it an actual proper thieves guild like you always wanted and we're told that this is actually based on something that really existed in paris it was called the court of miracles because it was centered on a courtyard there was a king in inverted commas and because the beggars who were blind or paralyzed during the day could see and walk the moment they returned home to the court at the end of a hard day's begging so it's a beggars vagabonds and thieves guild with their own rules for belonging to the court of miracles their own king marius lupin who we get stats for and a veritable rogues gallery of ne'er-do-wells working for them and we're given some bullet points as to how they might become involved in the investigation they've got eyes and ears everywhere if you make an ally of them they could be a useful resource maybe you can get some henchmen from them or if you need a bit of muscle for hire they could be pretty handy for that or maybe for whatever reason your party wizard needs to get hold of some shall we say less than legal items for his spells maybe the court can provide that for him at a price with a reasonable skim off the top obviously we get some details on the the various locations that the heroes might want to visit and these all have lovely maps provided with them so we get the crimson carriage of the sun which is one of the taxi firms we have the demon tailor's hideout where Marchant's hiding we have his shop where he works during his normal day-to-day -day life before slipping into his mask as the demon tailor and that sort of strange apocalyptic deluded persona that he's adopted we also get some information on how closely Richler is related to the killer at first Richler is a little bit cagey if he's confronted i mean after all he could make all of this go away with a wave of his hand such as his power at this point in time but he wants to actually find out what's going on and achieve some sort of a resolution after all if his brother is the guilty party then he's probably going to want to see him shuffled away into the shadows as well but he could make life very difficult or very easy for the player characters depending on how their interactions with him go during the actual scenario we get some details on how marshall might be brought to justice if he is brought to justice he's tried at the chalet in private although the characters can attend if they desire richelieu is present and looks furious three magistrates hear the case although they're worried about what richelieu is going to do if the characters haven't made the connection between marshall and richelieu the latter's presence will probably be quite baffling although the two of them do look fairly similar so that's a nice little visual clue there the tailor is charged with the murders of the missing children cannibalism and heresy the trial is swift and he is sentenced to death by burning at the stake and a sentence of damnatio more is passed all record of him is to be destroyed and his name is never to be spoken if the unrest dice is at five or more then the money that is taken from his belongings and the sale of his property is given to the families of the missing children to calm the situation down march on his march chained hooded and under guard to the hotel de vie where a stake has been set up and a large crowd gathered he is tied to the stake and burned although there is some confusion that last rites are not administered in the aftermath of this if he's been executed the unrest dice is reduced by two as things begin slowly going back to normal assuming they worked for the provost the characters will receive whatever reward they're negotiated probably around 500 silver pieces and don't forget that lamentations uses a silver piece standard so that would be the equivalent of like 500 gold in a non-lamentations game richler may have further input based on whether he's an enemy or a an ally of the player characters and finally we have an appendix where we're told we're given some optional events that may occur and some additional maps <laughs> there's also a nice appendix where it talks about you know if you 
if you want to get the musketeers involved in the game and even though strictly they probably wouldn't get involved let's face it who's going to miss that opportunity to have them appear in a game i'm certainly not and i love the fact that the author has offered some stats for them we get some a list of names appropriate for the setting again some more maps for potential places of interest and then a summary of the npc stats that are in the rest of the book so what do i think of this adventure module well again it's put together in a lovely way the the construction standard is very high and i very much enjoyed reading it and all as the author said it, it's sort of a challenge to do a jack the ripper in france style which i very much enjoyed it's available from the lamentations of the flame princess web store or if yeah, that's in pdf or hard copy or if you just want a pdf you can get it from drive through i'll put the prices at time of recording in the description of this episode i thought the style of the author made it very easy to read through although as i said a while ago the, the sort of slightly informal sort of jokey style didn't really land for me in some parts but that's just personal preference in no way did it really sort of hamper my enjoyment of this module there's good use of bullet points maps and diagrams throughout the adventure to make information easy to reference and i love the fact that pretty much everything you need for a particular element of this module is on a double page spread which combined with the contents page makes it very easy to find things and given that each page has a piece of artwork or a map on it it's pretty easy to find especially due to the larger titles although the font for the titles makes it not quite so easy as with some of the modules we looked at earlier this week to find what you're looking for by just flipping through the book i think the cartoon art style i think drawn by the author as well really sort of works with this and i was a little bit surprised i was thinking you know for like a sort of jack the ripper sort of murder mystery a cartoon style wouldn't really work for it but shows what i know works really very well although i can't help think that the the illustration of the musketeers at the end was based on the old um, dog tanyan cartoon where it was sort of ambulatory animals playing the muscul musketeers that i sort of used to watch when i was younger that's certainly what it reminds me of so that was a a fond memory i think the book is really interesting it doesn't really offer a great deal of advice per se on how to run an investigative scenario. It sort of assumes you know what you're doing and just gives you the, the locations, the maps, the clues and the people involved and lets you do your own thing. There's a couple of interesting mechanical tweaks. So like I said, the unrest dies, you know, the, the mechanics of Cardinal Richler and stuff like that. But I think probably this isn't going to be maybe such a great module for someone who's trying to run their first investigative scenario i think if you're going to look if you're sort of just dipping your toe in the water so to speak you might be better going with something like in a deadly fashion which we looked at at the start of the week but if you already have a couple of these this sort of session under your belt or you're just willing to throw yourself in and tackle it i think this is a really interesting module i would love to run it the only thing i would also say about it is that i don't think it's perhaps as easy to adapt to a different setting as some of the other modules we've looked at because so much of what's in terror in the streets is tied into this paris 1630 setting whilst i think if you're willing to put enough effort and time in you no doubt could change all the names you could change the city and stuff like that i think it'd be a lot more work than with some of the other modules we've looked at but if you're willing to put that work in you love a murder mystery maybe you're a fan of the sort of jack the ripper mythos or you just want an investigative scenario for your player characters to chew on or maybe you're really digging that 1630s france vibe definitely give this book a look I very much enjoyed reading it and I think it's a great example of how you can run an investigative scenario although it doesn't really hold the hand of the GM as you go through it as I've just said. So that's my flip through of Terror in the Streets for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. If you've enjoyed this episode please review, like, share, subscribe all that other stuff that YouTubers and podcasters are always asking you to do. And hopefully we'll see you next time. Whatever you're playing, take care, stay safe and have fun. Catch you later.